uh, if you have any questions, yeah, um, just type it out and then um, Josh will be able to um, read them out later and I can answer them. Uh, thanks very much for calling in. Uh, thanks to Ansamar for um, organizing and getting me involved with this. Uh, I think it's uh, really nice to you know share what I've learned um, from applying and you know starting my first year as a as a train, uh, junior doctor. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully everybody's uh, doing all right with lockdown and stuff. Uh, stay safe. Um, but let's uh, crack on. So yeah, um, just going to give you. A brief introduction of the talk. So I'm going to talk about what the AFP is, the pros and cons of the AFP, how to apply um, the application process, um, how, how it works and the interviews, differences between regions, uh, and then trying to maximize your chances and sort of my experiences with applying and things like that. Um, so at the end, then we can always um, go for the questions. Um, the talk will be mainly centered around um, uh, research because that's um, what I applied for but if you have any other questions about maybe medical education I can try and answer them um, but I'll be mainly focusing on research. Okay so uh, basically the AFP is um, broken down into research medical education leadership or management teams. Um, it is similar to the foundation program where you have two years um, and you have six different rotations, four months of it um, you will spend um, doing uh, research or in some programs they let you have one day off a week in your F2 year. So your research block will be always uh, in the F2, F2 year um, and every year it's about 5% of all the foundation training posts. Um, so this is how it looks like. I think you're all quite familiar with this. So basically this is the sort of pathway from medical school going to your foundation training and then going to special uh, specialty training. Um, if you go down the academic pathway, you'll do an ACF and then go on to a clinical lectureship. Then after that, become a senior lecturer. For the sake of the talk, we'll just focus on this uh, red box um, highlighted over here. So completing medical school um, and with or without an extra year in uh, doing a BMED sci or master's and then going on to your foundation program and hopefully into your academic foundation program. All right. So, um, so the pros and cons of the AFP. Um, so if you are interested in research, method or leadership, then this is going to be a great program for you. Um, it can help boost your, you know, your CV. It's very challenging actually to find time in training to do research and do like, you know, full-time clinical work at the same time. So having four months off in your F2 to um, fully focus on that is very useful. Um, to get things out like publications, going for conferences, um, speaking and networking and things like that. Um, there's also um, certain things that deaneries offer. So in Sheffield, they allow you to do a PG certificate, so a postgraduate certificate where it's fully funded. You would not have to pay for it. Um, and you can also do things like, I think I think Oxford's the one that gives a grant up to £1,000 for um, things like consumables and conferences. but um, or you know, things like teaching um, masters or medical students as uh, medical education uh, AFP that will give you certain opportunities. Uh, and things that you will learn, you know, as part of your training as, a, as academic, uh, things like statistics, academic writing, you know, it's all very transferable because, you know, even if you decide not to pursue further academic training after an AFP program, for example, um, you'll still look very um, good when you apply for other specialty training when you if you want to apply for a gp training you know if you want to go into core medical training or surgical training that's all very um transferable skills and people look highly upon that um so i guess a few cons or what people would consider cons you have four months less in clinical practice uh you might have a bit less choice of uh, which hospital um and academic rotations you get because you're already preset when you apply um certain deaneries will might offer a little choice in the academic project. That's fine if you are really interested in that project. Um, for example, if you're already having an interest in cardiology and they only offer um, you know, spots in that sort of department for that uh, program, then um, that would be uh, fine for you, but maybe not for someone else. Uh, in Sheffield, what they let you do is um, they allow you to contact people that might have similar interest, uh, research interests as yourself. 
uh, so you have a bit more flexibility in sort of designing um, your project, uh, who you collaborate with and things like that. And you get to choose a supervisor um, once you start um, in your F1 and then organize that throughout your F1 and get ready for F2. Um, that's the, the AFE application is also a bit more time consuming than the foundation program uh, application. So on top of, so you need to complete your foundation program application and then um, also work on your AFP application after that. That can be busy when you are in your fourth year and uh, sorry, start of your fifth year uh, or sixth year of medical school, um, getting ready for exams and things like that. That all does add up. So it could be um, quite a stressful time, um, which for me it was, and for many of the people that applied, it is, but we got out okay. So it's definitely doable. Um, so a few more pros. Um, you get a bit more stability, I think. Um, so usually if you go and get an AFP post um, in whether it's research academic, uh, sorry, in academic research or in medical education, you would be in the same hospital for both your F1 and F2 years. So you'd have to move around that much. Um, the SJT is not used in the application process. So the SJT is a situational judgment test. Uh, basically, if you're not familiar um, with that test, it's they give you a bunch of scenarios where you might have to think about what you would do in that scenario in the clinical setting or in the workplace setting. Um, and that could be very different for different people. So what I might put down as the right answer, someone else might think is the wrong answer and so on and so forth. So it's not very objective, I would say. Um, and if you apply for the AFP, if you pass the interview and you get an offer, they're not going to use the SJT in making you that offer. So that's, I would say, a pro. Um, and it's also, um, you know, as part of an academic foundation training, you'll be affiliated to university. So for example, in Sheffield, I have access to the libraries, courses, um, like um, the PG cert, uh, I can still use printing services, I can use all the computing services around as well. So that's quite nice. And you also you have access to all the um, journals and things like that. So you'd have to pay for a subscription. Um, and a couple more cons. So the academic block bit of your F2 year, that can be amended. So you might have a lower pay than um, compared to your other colleagues who would be doing more on calls or weekends, working at nights and things like that. Um, and then also you have to go through that interview. So for some, um, it would be sort of your first formal interview since A-levels, um, which can be a quite daunting process as well to prepare for. Um, but uh, we'll, you know, there's always support around, so people can uh, do help around as well to get, to get past that stage. But we'll cover that a bit later. So uh, moving on. Uh, so how you apply? So basically you complete your foundation um, program application, and you get to choose two academic units of application, or also like uh, called deaneries. Um, and those two terms are, are, are used trans, trans, transferably. Um, so London, for example, is considered one deanery, unlike, your, unlike the foundation program where it's split into quite a few different deaneries. So uh, Northwest Thames, North Central East Thames and South Thames, uh, you've got two stages of your application process. So there's the online application and then the interview. You must complete your foundation program um, application. So choosing which um, area of the UK you'd like to become a foundation uh, trainee. And then you'll move on to your academic uh, application. Um, so for the foundation program um, application, you get to rank all the deaneries in the UK, well as in the AFP application, you can only choose two um, deaneries. So in my case, I chose uh, Yorkshire and East Anglia, Cambridge. Uh, okay, so this is what the timeline looks like. So I got this from the latest um, uh, information from the UK FPO website. Um, the UK FPO is a, a body that um, sort of organizes uh, foundation, um, foundation training and all the dates for uh, applications and things like that. So if uh, you start off in October, you register on Aurel, which is sort of the online platform where you, you um, have in all your details, all your medical school details, all your personal details, and then um, you get registered on there. Then after that, you will have a deadline on, I think November is um, uh, later this year. Um, that's for the deadline, the AFP application. Um, and then they'll start 
from their long listing, short listing, and interviewing people from November to January. And then based on the latest uh, information, its uh, offers will be released from January, uh, mid-January to early February onwards. Um, so, yeah. Sorry. Cool. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything you're not clear about? No? Okay. Let's carry on. So that's the timeline. So this might, um, of course, change uh, based on sort of the uh, ongoing situation of the pandemic, but the, this is where we're at. Okay. Oh, I think somebody said something. Uh, so, okay, I just saw a message there. How does this differ from the foundation program timeline? So uh, just to quickly answer that uh, while I'm on this sort of point. Um, basically, um, it will all run in parallel. So I think you will find out about offers a little bit earlier than everybody else if you get an AFP job. So if you if you apply for the AFP, you will go through this timeline. You have to apply for the foundation program um, as well at the same time. I'm not sure exactly when the deadline is for the foundation program is uh, this year, but it'll be roughly around the same time. Um, and you have to submit your foundation program application before you apply for the AFP. So I would say the deadline is pretty similar to the AFP program in your case. Um, if you do apply this year, uh, in the future years, that's how it's been done in my year and the years before. Um, and usually if you don't get an AFP uh, position, then you'll be um, thrown back in the pool of all the foundation program um, applicants and then they will sort of release uh, results I think usually in March time around spring and then you, by April you'll know exactly where you'll be. But if you are an AFP applicant and if you uh, have a post, you'll find out about your jobs um, earlier than everyone else. Hope that's okay. So I'll move on. Um, so the online application, so it's based on your EPM, so your, uh, your performance score at school. Um, that's um, how you perform in exams and how you rank. And then additional information would be extra degrees, publications, uh, oral um, poster presentations at national, international, non-student conferences. Uh, that will be um, those things that score you points on your application uh, when you apply for the AFP program. Uh, and also, you also get points for uh, prizes or distinctions you receive in uh, medical school. So, for example, if you score, you know, in the top 10% of the year, for example, consistently, and you get an award for medical school, that does count as a prize. Um, and you also have white space questions. Um, so basically, it's a few questions. Most deaneries will have a similar sort of um, thing they like to ask the uh, yeah, applicants, uh, for example, like why do they want to apply for an AFP job? Why do, why do they think they'll be good at doing research? Any you know, experiences you had in research um, and things like that. Um, so the only places that don't have white space questions is uh, London and in Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, someone else, let's say something. These prizes like uh, external scholarships count towards, or is it only accolades given by the medical school? Yeah, so I would say external scholarships would count um, um, for, uh, yeah, it would count. So if you're not sure, I would say if you're not sure about uh, what counts as a prize, just put it down anyway, um, because it doesn't hurt that if, you, if you're not sure, then you can always put it down. And if they don't think that's gonna score you a point, then they will, um, they will just won't score you a point. Um, but yeah, usually from med school, from, you know, other organizations, like for example, if you wrote an essay and you won the first prize, that would be, um, something that d does count. Um, what is a competitive, I think that was the last. Uh, Sen, do you want to do the questions at the end, just so I can read them out for the recording? Okay. That's fine. Yeah. yeah thank you. That, that's fine. Yeah. Cause I keep getting uh, notifications. Cool, so yeah, we'll take that questions at the end. Sorry about that. Um, so 
Yeah, you, you, usually a long list, um, they'll start off usually based just on the EPM and then the short list will be based on your white space questions and additional information like the degrees, publications, prizes and things like that. I think based in 2018's um, application, uh, the long list in London uh, for EPM was 41. That means you had to come in in the top, I think I would say 20% um, in your year, then you'd be suitable to you know, go for a short list. And then after that, you needed another 10 points from additional information. So things like extra degrees, publications, uh, and things like that, which uh, it's, yeah, I would say London is definitely more competitive than other deaneries, but we'll go into that a bit more later. Um, so that's how it's done. Uh, I think Sheffield, for example, sorry, not Sheffield, Yorkshire, they try and interview as many uh, applicants as they can. Um, and then once they fill up all the applicants, then they'll see what the cut off or EPM is and then they'll cut off based from that. So it changes every year, depending on how many people apply. Um, that's fine. So white space question. So each academic unit of application have their own questions. Um, there's a link that I'll leave on so you can check it out later in your own time. Uh, you have around two weeks to complete your questions and you need to, for example, uh, provide uh, examples of research, teaching, management, teamwork, um, and how you contribute, you know, basically to say how have you contributed to how you're going to do in um, as, an, as an AFP doctor. So you need to give examples of what you've done, your previous experiences and things like that. Um, you can use GMC's duty as a doctor and look up the uh, person specification as well from the UK FPO website when it's closer to the time, just to see what they are looking for and what they, they want uh, in a successful applicant. Most of the time it's um, quite obvious from the store we know who, who, who applies and how people feel themselves about um, going for these uh, sort of posts because they would have been building up uh, across uh, med, uh, their time in med school uh, before they apply. So um, those are the people that would definitely go want to go for these posts. Um, so you would kind of have a rough idea, but you can use that as a, sort of a more um, careful guide. Um, a lot of people like to use this framework called the STAR framework when answering this white space question. So you have a situation, um, so what, what you've done, what, um, and, sorry, just say, you know that. Um, so you have a situation, what you've done to change that and improve that uh, and the result and how, and how you feel about it. Um, that's quite a nice way to uh, answer those questions. Um, it's always, I think more important, not about the, I think the content is important, but I think what's more important is the way you reflect on what you've done, because what you don't want is um, writing just about the things you've done, like a list. So you could be the president of a certain society at medical school, or you've done um, research at the, this institution, um, published this paper, or if you present at this conference, that's, um, you don't want to be listing all that. You, what you want to tell people is you've, how those things sort of shape you to be uh, a great applicant um, for the, the post that you want to get um, and what you've learned from your experiences. I think that is probably more crucial than what you actually did. Um, and always try and get uh, someone to um, have a look at your answers. Um, usually you can have um, a mentor that you have at medical school or a more senior medical student or a, a newly graduated uh, doctor as well who recently applied. Uh, most people would be more than happy to try and help because they've been in that similar situation before. Um, but yeah, definitely um, don't um, just write it yourself and then send it off because there's always room for improvement. But then again, don't get like 20 people to look at it, maybe one or two or three people to give you good and honest feedback. I think that's more uh, important. Um, you don't want too many people like spoiling uh, what you've written or, and that changes the entire message of what you've written so it doesn't come off as genuine and people can see that when uh, you send off those uh, answers. All right, so moving on. Um, so the interview, I'll just give general advice because we're not close to interview time at the moment and I appreciate that not everybody here would be a final year student or close to being a final year student. Uh, but basically most deaneries have different interview formats so just uh, look through the handbooks on the UK uh, through the UK FPO website, and then try to contact someone who's done that specific uh, interview before. Usually you have two stations, uh, clinical and academic station. 
Um, so the clinical station would be, um, they give you a scenario about um, maybe a medical emergency and what you would do in that situation to um, help your patient. Um, the academic um, station would be more about um, things like what research you've done, what do you think uh, makes a good academic. And I have a few example questions um, later on, um, but basically, um, there are mainly two stations. Um, most medical schools have um, academic medical societies and they, they organize mock interviews. So when the time is closer, keep a lookout for that and go for as many as you can. Um, and I would find um, any previous research supervisors or any tutors you have at medical school, if um, they have time and you're comfortable enough to ask for some uh, feedback for a mock from a mock interview, that would be very helpful as well. And of course, you can always uh, practice with your friends uh, and also get some fee feedback. Okay, um, so moving on. So, um, so clinical scenarios wise, um, a lot of um, applicants would go through like the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine, go through those emergency sections. Uh, things like acute pancreatitis, ruptured triple A's and acute abdomens are also um, some of those things I would add on to the emergency list on the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. Um, people like to ask uh, things about, you know, paracetamol overdoses, DKAs, pancreatitis, asthma, and how you manage that. Um, uh, how you manage that initially. Know your investigations and the key things that you should do in that sort of uh, situation, uh, and then practice. Make sure you practice a lot with your friends, um, because by the time you apply for um, the AFP and foundation uh, program training, um, you'd um, already be. Um, quite close to being an F1 doctor. So this is just to supplement that. And the, uh, it's quite good as well to sort of have a framework of how you would approach a, you know, a certain problem. Um, and that would definitely help as well, as well when you approach your final uh, exams and things like that. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think, uh, again, we're still quite early on, but this is just a flavor of what um, you can expect. Uh, and how you can uh, prepare for it. Okay, uh, so the academic station, everybody has, like I said, di different style, but certain deaneries want you to talk about your research. Uh, if you're applying for medical education, your previous experience of that. Some people will get you to analyze an abstract that they don't tell you about, or maybe tell you about a week before you go for your interview. Um, for example, places like London will try and do that. Uh, they can um, also give you um, in, uh, information in the form of a, a graph or a figure um, and get you to um, try and interpret that during the interview and communicate what you think uh, are the results like. Um, but I would say a lot of um, deaneries, for example, um, in Yorkshire, um, they usually go for more talking about your research experience first. And then certain other deaneries, it's quite deanery specific and they will tell you beforehand as well. So you would um, know how to prepare before you, you go into your interview. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the academic station in Yorkshire and Humber um, where I applied, applied to and got an interview at. So the things that they like to ask is, why did you choose the AFP program? Why did you choose to do uh, apply for research? Why did you choose uh, to apply in Sheffield, uh, sorry, into, why did you apply, uh, choose to apply to this deanery? Things like what the difference between the F, uh, foundation program and the academic foundation program, things like that would be quite important to know because they would expect you to know what you're getting yourselves into. Um, previous research experience, um, any projects you have in mind, um, how you balance, I think, between um, your clinical work and being an academic as well. An academic trainee is quite important because they are looking out for um, you know, people that are really keen and are able to manage their, their time well, because there's a lot going on at the same time. Um, they might ask you to talk about a paper, but that's not, um, I would say, quite common, but they can ask you things like that. And then they can ask you to talk about your strengths and weaknesses as well. I think the point of the academic station is trying to get to know you as well, I've, I felt from my interview. Um, so um, that's how the, uh, the interview was conducted. It's more of like a conversation. Um, and that is, of course, deanery dependent, but uh, that's what's uh, happened at York, uh, Yorkshire and Humber when I applied. Uh, so the things that they can also ask you, um, things that challenges or barriers to research, examples of teamwork or leadership, 
where you see yourself in the future and how you do uh, research in the future. Um, they asked about, uh, they could ask you about the role of an academic. So if you're a clinical researcher, what would your role be in the NHS and society wider in, yeah, in the wider context? And also um, things like what is an important trait in an academic? Um, again, those are things that you can sort of um, reflect and prepare beforehand. Um, before you go into an interview. So, um, and last bit is about teaching as well. So even in uh, a research uh, interview, they could ask you about other, other things as well, um, not just directly related to research. So it's important that you are a well-rounded and balanced candidate, right? So those are all the sort of potential in, uh, questions that they could ask you. Um, and that's based on my um, experience from the Yorkshire and Humber interview when I applied. Um, so I would go a little bit more into the key values of an academic because I think that's quite important. Um, so I mentioned a bit about um, time management, it's, uh, especially good uh, for AFP doctors because um, you have less time to complete all your clinical competencies compared to your colleagues in F2. So you need to know how to prioritize and be very disciplined. You need to be very highly motivated. Um, I think because if you're thinking about doing research, you're going to have lots of um, problems and bumps in the way. So um, you really need to be diligent, motivated and persistent with uh, pursuing your goals. Uh, so those are some examples that I uh, would say are quite key values of an academic. Um, so I mentioned a bit about resilience, um, being able to um, go through uh, failure and come back from that, accept criticism and feedback and build on it constructively. And also um, being resourceful and flexible um, because things don't go well all the time. So you might have to go, have a backup plan and um, go, go from there. Um, so um, for example, this is another uh, academic question um, example. So how would you differentiate between the foundation program and academic foundation program and how you compensate for it? So like I said, I think those previous traits I mentioned can be useful in uh, this context where uh, you can say, um, you know, what, uh, sorry, you can show the examples of how you, you are a disciplined person, you are a motivated person, and therefore you show some evidence of being able to cope with, um, for example, the less time that you have in your F2 year to complete your clinical competencies. Um, so you can, so how I approach this sort of question is basically state the difference and then sort of give examples of how you can um, compensate for those differences uh, in your training and things like that. Um, so another um, question would be how you balance between clinical and academic responsibilities. Again, um, showing what you've done throughout school um, and uh, showing your experiences in balancing your clinical and academic. Oh, sorry, I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's disappeared now. Uh, so yeah, uh, showing how you'd be able to balance your time well. I think you should give you should be able to give evidence pretty um, easily during an interview. Not to say that you are a robot regurgitating your answers, but you should have something at the back of your head that you can sort of explain quite fluently to an interviewer so uh, they know what you're talking about and you're serious about you know pursuing this what the last thing that you want is going in there and stammering about you know the different things that you've done and then not coming to answer the question clearly because um, you didn't prepare enough so um, in that sense uh, preparation is very key so um, another method that people like, which I mentioned earlier, is a star framework. So what's happening, um, talking about the situation, uh, speaking about the task um, and the goals that you set for yourself, what you did. Um, so I would say focus on what you did because um, although you are, uh, mo most people you know, do research as part of a team, you have to show what your contributions to the team are and how you work with the team rather than um, saying that, oh, we did this together, we did that. Instead of, uh, it's not that you show the, that teamwork is not important, it, it, is, it is very important, but you have to show how you contribute to the team and um, show a specific example so that people are aware of your contributions. 
And then um, of course the result is to speak about the outcome of your action. And also I think the other R that's missing over there would be reflect. So what you've taken away from your self experience. So if you can use this in your, um, you don't have to use this framework, but it's just a popular one that people like to. So I'll put it out there for you. Um, so the differences in deanery, so um, competition ratios are different uh, across deaneries. Um, I can I have another slide that shows you some of the competition ratios from a couple of years ago. Um, and some places might not have all, uh, some places might not have research. Uh, most places do. Uh, some places might not have a med ed or leadership um, EFPs, for example. Uh, some um, places are not so flexible um, with um, um, the program. So there might be only fixed teams, like for example, only in cardiology, maybe in GP. Um, so uh, Yorkshire and Humber, for example, has a flexible research team. So you can sort of dictate what you want to um, do in your uh, research um, your research time. Um, the application process, um, most of it will be the same deadlines, but I would say the interviews would be different. So when I applied, the Northwest Deanery had the same exam date as the Sheffield final exams. Um, so I, I didn't apply to that because I would not be able to make it in time for that interview. Uh, so just something to be aware of. White space questions will be different across deaneries. Um, London and Yorkshire and Humber do not have white space questions. But you know, of course, keep checking because that's, this is based on my, my experiences. Uh, and I checked last year as well. They didn't have uh, white space questions in London and Yorkshire and Humber. So this might change but um, you can find that out later in the year. Uh, the types of interviews, so like I said, Yorkshire and Humber is a bit more friendly about your chat, uh, a bit more like a chat about your experiences. Um, London uh, will, will make you critically analyze an abstract, Northwest as well will make you interpret graphs, et cetera. Um, and the differences again, so your AFP block might be four months in your F2 year, um, or it could be one day off a week, um, in your F2 year, it depends on where you are. Uh, and that might work for some people and might not work for some uh, others because if you're in a lab, for example, and if you want to do experiments, um, having one day off a week might not be very um, conducive for that. And you would rather have four months off to do your experiments right in the lab to get uh, sufficient results. Uh, and benefits of the deanery. So like, yeah, like I said, um, Yorkshire and Humber have a PG cert uh, which you can, you can participate in. Uh, and that's fully paid for Yorkshire, uh, sorry, Oxford, from what I heard of the last time, they have hundred pounds grant that you can use to attend conferences, and things like that. Um, so these are sort of the competition ratios from 2018. Um, so just a quick summary, um, basically Yorkshire and Humber's competition ratio is like one to three. So um, Cambridge was one to six, Oxford was quite high at one to 12. So for every one spot, there'll be sort of 12 people going for it. And London is one, one to seven. Um, so depending uh, where you are and where you want to go, um, this might uh, of, of course be a, a factor that you use when you choose where to go and apply for. Um, so this is from 2018. I tried to find the latest data, but I don't think it's out yet. So uh, you can always keep an eye out for it uh, later this year. Um, so maximize, so now a bit more about maximizing your application. I think I've talked quite a lot now um, about the process, uh, what to expect in your interview um, and how you go about um, preparing for that very briefly. Um, there, I see quite a lot of questions coming in, so definitely I'll be looking at that later on. Um, so how to maximize your application. I think uh, it's quite relevant um, whether you're in, you know, Second, third year of medical school, fourth, fifth year is, uh, I think, quite relevant on um, this bit. So definitely prepare, prepare and prepare. Um, do your homework, look through deanery websites as soon as you can for information about potential projects, research teams, um, and then also think about uh, research areas of interest yourself or what sort of projects you want to get into. And I think the only way to know about that is if you actually do research. Um, so spending time in your summers or um, your SSEs or electives, um, trying to get yourself uh, involved in research. Um, so you can also contact uh, academics before your application to discuss fit, uh, maybe look for a potential supervisor um, before you apply. 
um, you can read up on people's work. I think definitely read up before you reach out to them because what people don't want is um, someone reaching out to them, uh, writing a long email and then not knowing exactly what they're looking for and what the person is doing because that would be a waste of your time and the other person's time. Um, and if you want to continue working with someone, let's say if you have someone in medical school that you have worked with, uh, maybe as part of your BMED side or, or one of your XSCs, um, communicate that during your interview. That's, um, that shows that you've done uh, some digging around uh, and you're already thinking forward um, about uh, doing more research when you uh, carry on in your uh, AFP job uh, in the research post. Um, and then for those that are applying later this year, of course, um, they'll release the white space questions and then um, you can look through them before you apply so you can sort of prepare in advance rather than waiting towards the deadline and then you start getting worried about your exams, interviews and all that application stuff as well. So start preparing when you can. So I know that's a bit more about uh, people uh, hoping to apply probably later this year or in the next year or so. Um, so if you're on the fence, um, I would say just apply anyway, because putting in the application is relatively not too much work. The interviews are also very useful because they um, would be, it would be quite a while before you um, have any more interviews if you don't have um, an AFP interview, because the next interview will probably be for core training or uh, in core medical training, core surgical training, or GP training, or psychiatry training. So in a way, um, I would say if you're on the fence, you should apply if you're interested. Um, general advice, I think, uh, would be more relevant as well for our younger uh, uh, preclinical students. Uh, so those in year one, two, and three. So if you can, please uh, try and ma maximize your opportunities to participate in research um, and figure out how you can contribute to projects given your schedule. So maybe a lab-based uh, project might be difficult to contribute to if the, you know, the supervisor is um, needing you to be physically there, but you have to go on placements if you have lectures to attend. Um, I would say do not participate in research for the sake of ticking a box because it doesn't work out well for anyone and it's very, very uh, difficult and time consuming. Um, and if you can, uh, you have the opportunity for sure, consider an additional degree in the area that you're interested in. Um, so things like a BMAT side, a master's, um, that would be very useful and definitely can boost your application. Uh, but again, don't do it for the sake of ticking a box because um, a year out um, and not doing very much in that year out would be a year wasted, I would say. Uh, and it's also, if you have to pay for extra rent and things like that, or pay for your courses, if you're self-funding, that would be also very tricky. Um, but if you can, that's that's great. Um, so if you don't have a BMED side extra degree, uh, degree don't don't worry, just apply anyway. Um, if you're applying for this year, look through the specs of the person that will be selected for the post. I think trying to find the fit and what people are look um, you know looking for, I think that's very important. And then showcase evidence of academic potential. So that's um, regardless of um, anyone who's not. Um, thinking about a BMAT side, if you have a BMAT side already. So what they really want to get out of the interview is to, to, to know if you have academic potential and you have to communicate that well in, 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 uh, during your interview. Um, so, so if you're applying in the near future and not planning to intercalate, start getting research experience, I think that is really, really key because you would, again, you would not know whether you like it or not uh, unless you try uh, and you have to spend time and um, also make sure you maintain a good academic standing. So I'm not saying you have to come in the first in your year all the time, but try and um, hit as high as you can um, uh, and do your best all the time. Okay, so um, moving on. So, so, so just to wrap things up, uh, I appreciate it's getting close to the top of the hour now. So uh, my experience, uh, I didn't actually um, apply with an extra degree. I completed my five-year uh, MBCHP course in Sheffield. I did quite a lot of research during my SSCs and electives. Started doing research in medical school. So in my first year of medical school, I started with um, uh, doing a summer uh, research experience back home in Malaysia. That's where I'm from. Um, and then subsequently, I started reaching out to people uh, in Sheffield. And you know, I also did um, an SSC in the States at Duke University. 
Um, and also I did an elective in Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. So um, all those experiences I believed helped boost my application. And also, I was also doing research during medical school. Um, it helped that it was a computational project um, that I was mainly uh, involved in so I could work uh, in my own time after clinical placements, after lectures and things like that. Uh, and by the time I applied, I had presented at, at conferences um, both nationally and internationally and had a preprint of my uh, of a manuscript um, before the, the application was due. Um, so for those of you who are not sure, a preprint is basically a, a version of the manuscript that has not been peer reviewed. Um, so that would not count uh, as a point in your application, but it does show that you have, uh, you know, done some some work. And I think people do appreciate that it takes time to publish. So having something is better than having, I would say nothing uh, before you apply. Um, and yeah, I applied to Yorkshire uh, and East Anglia and Cambridge. I was rejected without interview uh, at Cambridge. Uh, I had an interview and subsequently was accepted into South Yorkshire, uh, the program over here as uh, a research AFP. So I'm currently still in my F1 year. Uh, we're just about uh, to end it. Uh, and after this, I'll start in uh, F2. And my research um, block would be around December time. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Okay, so uh, so the resources are available in the slides. The links all, I hope, work. Um, and we have a few more over here. So there's a, the AFP website. There's an article there that talks about their uh, academic foundation program as well. And there's some YouTube um, videos um, that you can look through in your own time as well. Um, and that's more about academic units of application as well uh, through that link. Um, I'll send out the slides um, after the talk to Josh uh, from NSMR, and I think he will be able to distribute it to everyone. Um, but if you have any questions, um, you can always ask me after this. Um, these are just some of the screenshots of the YouTube channel I was point talking about. Uh, this is an academic uh, doctor down in Cambridge, I think. Uh, and he gives quite a nice um, overview of various topics that you can watch in your own time. Uh, and a few books as well. I didn't personally use any of these books, but some of my friends found them to be quite useful. Um, and you can have a look at them as well if you want in your own time. Um, and this is just a little bit of the academic units of applications. Um, just a bit of information from each uh, deanery. Uh, this is from the year I applied, so uh, in late 2018. Um, but there will be updated versions when the time is closer. So just keep an eye out um, for that when it's available. And they have links to the individual foundation schools as well. Um, so this is just page one, that's page two, and this is the last page. Um, so yeah, I think we're at the end of the talk at the moment. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if any e uh, questions, just feel free to email me if I don't get to answer all your questions tonight, but I'll uh, do my best. So, uh, thank yeah. Very much. Thank you very much, Zen. That was very beneficial. Um, I've scrolled up a bit on the chat to read some of the questions that were coming through during the talk. So I'll try and work through some of them, but I appreciate that we won't be able to do all of them. Um, so the first question is, does a master's degree as an intercalation put you in a stronger position than an intercalated BSc degree? Uh, sorry, give me a second. Um, uh, master's, master's program compared to intercalated Yes, see. Um, I think it depends on the intercalate your 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 performance on the intercalated BSc. So if you have a first in your intercalated BSc, I think it might be equivalent to a master's. Um, but I think you would have to check based on the latest information because when I applied, I think that was the case. Um, if you have if you scored uh, maybe you got two one or two two, that will bring your points lower, but you'll still score a point at the very least. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, do you get to choose which specific hospitals or track you want, similar to the normal foundation program? Um, so, in a sense, you get to choose where you are. So, for example, if you apply to Yorkshire and Humber, you get to rank the areas within Yorkshire and Humber. So, South Yorkshire, where Sheffield is, um, West Yorkshire, where Leeds is, and then North Yorkshire, where York and um, Hull is. So, in that sense, you get to choose where you are, and then based on your performance in the interview, you, you, you have to rank all the places that you want before you go for interview. And depending on how you perform an interview, you get the choice of first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. 
Um, and then when you choose how to rank it, it would be based on a set of jobs. So it's like a preset of jobs. For example, when I applied, um, my current uh, jobs uh, in F1 are the psychiatry, geriatric medicine, and general surgery. I was supposed to rotate onto general surgery, but because of the pandemic, I'm still in geriatric medicine. Uh, and in F F2, I have uh, neurology, research, and um, diabetes, and di uh, endocrine and diabetes. So that comes as a preset, um, and you get to sort of rank those jobs. And then based on your interview performance, you hopefully get your first, second, third choice, and so on. Um, yeah, hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, I've scrolled down a bit and someone asked, could you use Academic Foundation for more technological based research projects as they're thinking of doing a data science project? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's actually what I'm doing um, for my, that's what I propose to do uh, for my project later this year. So definitely you can do that. Um, you just need to find someone that would be able to sort of supervise you. And that would be sort of deanery dependent because some deaneries might allow you the flexibility and some might say mm, you have to stick to the teams that we already have. So um, you have to keep a lookout for that. Yeah, but it's possible for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, roughly when are white space questions released and is this deanery dependent? Um, I don't think it was deanery dependent. So when I checked last year, it was around let's say October time, sometime in, the, like sometime in the fall, I would say closer to it's um, October time. But they usually have a, just one document and there's all the white space questions all together. So yeah. Thank and you. they'll release at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try yeah. the question. Um, would the publication from your intercalated BSC year count towards publication points or not because the BSC has its own points? Uh, not really sure what that means. Okay, uh, so if you publish in your BSC year, you get points for getting a BMSI and also you get points for publishing a paper. Um, if it's like a thesis at the end of a, of a master's, for example, a BMSI, that one had, if you don't publish that, then you will not get points if that's what you mean. Um, yeah, but you, you get points for BSC or an extra degree and you also get points for um, publishing a paper. Thank you. Um, are you able to see the different tracks before you start applying for AFP, sort of from the different deaneries? Yes, so if, sorry, let me just check. So yeah, if you look at this uh, sort of sheet, I think I went through it a bit quickly just now. So you get to see which deaneries have which sort of tracks. So for example, Cambridge only have research. Um, Essex has only met at, um, London has met at and research. Um, some places in London, for example, in South Thames, they also have management and leadership with um, AFPs. So you can see that before you apply, yeah. Thank you. I think we only have a few more questions. So uh, does it matter what university you go to or what uni you intercalate in, or is it just based more on grades? Uh, for points, yeah, it's definitely based on grades. It doesn't matter uh, where you went to. Um, so that would be um, the key factor, whether you, how, how well you perform in your BSc year or your master's or things like that. Yeah, performance. Thank you. Uh, do merits at each year of university count, i.e. for academic performance in top 10% of the year? Yeah, I think they will count. Most people will put them down um, on their application and um, like I said earlier, if you don't think that was, um, if you're not sure whether it will count as a point, I'll put it down anyway, but I would, I would think that will count because I've heard of people putting it down before. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, it's just scrolled up. Uh, do collaborator publications count in points? I'm not exactly sure of this um, because I've heard before that you should be a first author, but I would say you should still put it down and it should count, but I, I, I'm not exactly sure because I haven't checked in a bit, but uh, you should get the most updated information when, you, uh, when it's time to apply, when it's closer to apply. Um, if you get a first author publication, that's great. Um, not many people do, um, especially at this stage of your, your careers. Um, 
if you don't, if you're still a collaborator on it, I think that's still a great thing because there's still lots to take away from. Um, and you cannot, even if you, if it doesn't come for a point, you can still talk about it in an interview. And I think that will shine very well in the application anyway. Um, but to answer your question, I'm not exactly sure. I think it does, but you need to check again before you apply. Uh, a similar question. So do student conferences prizes count? I think for conferences, it should be at the national or international level. Um, so I don't think that counts. Yeah. Uh, do we need to provide references as part of the AFP application? Um, you usually don't have to. Um, but I got some of the people that I worked with um, during my time at medical school um, just to write a very brief, uh, maybe one, maximum two pages about what I did and how I contributed as well and uploaded it in my application. But I don't think people looked at that. So I don't think that's really neat. But if you have it, that's great. Yeah. It doesn't hurt. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take one more. Um, what do you need to take in a portfolio like for specialty interviews? Uh, so specialty interviews, um, I think the first thing would be interest in that specialty. So evidence based on that, if you try, for example, if you want to be a surgeon, you would hopefully um, have some rotations in surgery uh, throughout your training. Um, and that's one a way to show um, you are interested in the, in the specialty or if you have um, an SSC in surgery or an elective in surgery, that would be a great way to show evidence of that as well. Um, things like publications do count, things like teaching experiences, um, involvement in quality improvement projects um, do count as well in your application when you apply for specialty training. Um, and also evidence of teaching and mentoring students, that also counts. So in a lot of ways, applying for the AFP program will help you when you apply for your specialty training as well, because by the time you hit specialty training, you would have had some of these things um, if you went through an AFP program. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll leave the questions there for now. If people still have questions, are they okay to email you? Yes, for sure. So my email is right there. Uh, you can take a screenshot, take a photo. Um, I'll try and get to your questions. Um, I might take maybe a day or two if you know if I get busy and stuff. But for sure, I'll do my best to get to you um, through email. Uh, I'll send Josh um, the slides as well, yeah. uh, and they can go through that in their own time as well. Yeah, so that's not a problem. Yeah. And I'll put a recording on the. Uh, I'll put it on YouTube and attach it onto Facebook as well, so <laughs> be able to watch it again if you wanted to. Uh, but thank you very much for that, Sen. That was very helpful. Um, and I'm sure everyone found that very sort of beneficial. Great. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Um, sure. Uh, have a good evening and stay safe. Uh, see you around. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Thank for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.